Looks like we're pretty stable, so we can just get started. Um, my name's Chaz Ballou. I'm from Aptable, and uh, I'm joined by AJ Trano from Thread. And uh, just to go over some logistics, so we're gonna talk and present slides for about uh, 40, 45 minutes. There should be a Q&A interface in your webinar. The Zoom software should have a, a questions and the answers uh, interface that you can drop questions into. Uh, as we go along, uh, we'll have that open, and at the end, we'll do open question and answers. Um, so we'll pick up anything that we haven't answered, but if you think of something, you can go ahead and drop it in there, and we'll either get to it as we go or get to it um, at the moment. So uh, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to AJ. I'm going to turn my video off so as not to be uh, distracting, um, and then uh, let AJ take it away. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is AJ Triano, uh, VP of Digital at Thread Research. Some of the topics we want to cover today, uh, just to give you a sense of where we're headed, uh, a little bit of a quick overview on ResearchKit, then we'll talk uh, through some examples of some studies, including taking a specific look at a study we produced uh, with John Hopkins University, that study is called EpiWatch. Uh, Chaz is going to walk us through some content related to regulatory, security, and IRB considerations. Then we want to talk a little bit about what it's like to translate a traditional site-based clinical study into the world of a mobile device and the kinds of considerations you need to take into account to do that. And then a little bit of framing up the mindset uh, with regards to how to compare costs because they are two different worlds, a site model versus uh, a mobile health uh, approach. And we'll give you some, uh, some top things to think about when it comes time to start comparing uh, which approach is right for you. So a little bit first, just covering what is ResearchKit. Uh, just spending a brief amount of time here. Uh, ResearchKit is a framework, uh, an open source framework produced by Apple. Uh, it is uh, a, a bit of code that lives in GitHub. And it is, since it's open source, uh, available for anyone to use for free. Uh, and as well, uh, the expectation is, is that hopefully as we all use it, we'll contribute back to it so that together we can grow a powerful framework to help advance research uh, and reduce the cost and friction to do so. Now to understand how research kit exists in the world of an iPhone, uh, we also need to look at a few other things that happen in the iPhone. So let's first look at health kit. HealthKit is another framework that was introduced by Apple a couple of years ago. And what HealthKit does is it gathers data both from the native sensors on the iPhone as well as external data, both from external sensors as well as other applications running on iPhone as well as from web that allow you to send data uh, into HealthKit using the framework. Now, most of us are familiar with the output of that framework if you've used something uh, on the, the iPhone called Health App. This is a native app produced by Apple that displays that data back to you, so you can see it there. Uh, fitness advocates and, and, and uh, uh, health uh, gurus alike would also probably recognize this data showing up in other apps, such as RunKeeper uh, or, or uh, workout and dietary apps of that nature. Now, that's enabled because HealthKit can send data externally outside of itself to other applications, and it also can send it to other frameworks, such as ResearchKit. And what ResearchKit does is uh, out of the GitHub repository, you can actually utilize four modules that exist uh, already. One is for consent, which streamlines the digital consent process using something called eConsent uh, that was pioneered by Sage Bionetworks. Uh, we have active tasks, uh, which I'll talk a bit more uh, about in a minute, uh, but active tasks are a combination of, of, of activities plus some computation that occurs on the device to produce data for meaning and insight gathering. Then there are surveys, uh, where we can just directly ask participant surveys in the context of the application, and then a participant dashboard where we display that data back. Now that data also is important to researchers. So it would show within the, the app as you determine is appropriate uh, for the participants to see, as well as being shared outside of the app to whatever database choice that you choose. Aptable, of course, has a great framework uh, or a great uh, product for that and, uh, and uh, an compliant environment, and they'll speak more in just a few minutes to some key considerations you should think about when it gets time to think about data storage. But this is a very brief uh, way to look at ResearchKit and how it fits into the ecosystem. So the question becomes, how are people using ResearchKit today? Uh, what kinds of research studies are being done? And we're seeing two primary models that have come into market. The first is an augmentation to the site-based approach. 
uh, we sort of think about this as the in-clinic plus homework model, where you still have participants come in, particularly for the original uh, consent process, and in that model, the research kit application on the phone oftentimes can be used to streamline the consent process and gather the signatures quickly, reducing paperwork and time. And then the device, the, the, the app goes home with the participant on the device, and in that model, you're now gathering much richer data in between sites visit, site visits. So we're doing a couple of things in that model. Not only are we getting more continuous stream of data that's useful to you in your study, uh, but we're also reducing some of the problems associated with site-based studies, such as patient-reported memory bias, where they come back after an extended period of time and they report what they think they remember or what they think you want to hear. Whereas in, in a, an in-clinic plus homework model, you can see that uh, participant as many times as you need to, uh, hopefully not very often, and then in between visits get continuous data uh, in more real time, uh, more contextually re relevant, and hopefully with lower bias. And perhaps the predominant model that we're seeing research could be used for is a, replete, a complete replacement of the site model approach. In this uh, mechanism, you're reaching out to, to participants entirely digitally. Uh, that can be through the use of media, through print ads that are sent out, uh, through flyers posted uh, in doctor's offices or health clinics. And you're getting people to download the app through, directly from the, the, the app store, and they're participating entirely remotely. And there are quite a number of studies that are following this model. Many of you uh, have probably heard of some of these studies already, uh, including the first five research kit studies that launched. You can see they span quite a number of academic institutions, uh, as well as private research teams, and they cover quite a number of, of therapeutic and research areas, as well as some disease states. So everything from breast cancer to hep C, to general sleep health, concussion, uh, and epilepsy, uh, as well as asthma, you can see there's quite the, the, the range of possibilities that are already in market. If we take just a quick peek at a couple of these to help provide some greater context, you can see here an example of the Empower study. Uh, this is being conducted by the University of Rochester and Sage Bio Networks. And the goal of this study is to, to get a better picture about Parkinson's disease and its progression. Uh, what's showing on screen here is an example of an active task. Uh, here a participant's asked to tap the two circles at the bottom of the screen as quickly as they can in a, in a set period of time. And by doing so, we can monitor uh, progression of the disease and look for early hallmarks of, 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 of changes to disease state. Um, one of the things that is highlighted on Apple's website related to the study is that uh, when it launched in 2015, it enrolled over 10,000 participants. So you can see the potential reach of research kit and using mobile clinical study approaches. And what's important here is also to note that 93% of the participants had never taken part of any research before. So you're reaching not only a much bigger audience, but potentially a more diverse audience that can really make up a better uh, study population pool. Another example is uh, the Duke University and University of Cape Town's partnership to bring us autism and beyond. In this application, uh, it's actually using the device sensors through the, uh, the, the camera in a very novel way. Uh, so algorithms utilize that camera to monitor facial features, and we can see as an example on this screen, they look for detection of emotion in reaction to some form of stimuli presented in the application. The goal here is to uh, see if they can identify hallmarks of autism earlier using things like the camera to do so. Great research being conducted by this team. The third example that I wanted to share with you and to provide more detail about how research kit can leverage the sensors and, and the device capabilities to generate great data for you is in the example of EpiWatch. And this is a study that we at Thread Research produced with Johns Hopkins University. And the goal of this study is to look at uh, epilepsy and seizure, uh, seizures and the hallmarks of seizures that occur in the body. The key challenge here uh, for epilepsy, as you can see from the image on the screen, is that we have tremendous sensors that produce uh, an amazing insight into what's happening in the brain during, uh, during an epileptic seizure. But what we don't, unfortunately, have the ability to do is to send the, uh, these kinds of devices out with people in their daily life. And what that results in is that we actually don't know a whole lot about the different types of seizures and what's happening in the body 
because people are unfortunately not able to uh, uh, with these kinds of devices on their heads all the time. And it's too often. And if I notice there's just, uh, if you could just uh, mute your volume if you're participating, I think we can hear a little bit of background noise. Thanks. So our, the, the need here is to understand seizures better by capturing contextual data, information that helps us understand what's happening in the body as well as how how uh, participants uh, who suffer from a seizure react immediately coming out of a seizure. Uh, and we can look at contextual data to help provide that information by looking at the seizure type and duration, the frequency, the responsiveness, and the cognition of the participant during and after a seizure event. And we can look for correlation factors using the research kit framework. We can look at triggers and medication adherence and side effects. So how do we do that? Well, there's a number of ways we can monitor clinical manifestations. Uh, using uh, this, uh, the, the capabilities of the iPhone and Apple Watch. First, we can look for convulsions and shaking using the accelerometers on both devices. Uh, and the nice thing to compare there is the movement on the wrist versus the movement at the hip and actually determine if there's a difference uh, that we can detect uh, in the type and severity of the shaking and convulsion. We can monitor for falls using the gyroscope. We can look for heart rate increase, uh, as we do on uh, Apple Watch. This is notable in epilepsy because about 80% of seizures have a spike in heart rate ahead of time, so it could be a powerful predictor measure. And we can monitor unresponsiveness of participants looking at the user interface on the watch and also the phone as a way to gather, uh, to assess people's uh, cognition and, and, ability, and awareness uh, during and after a seizure event. So, what do we do with that data we gather with the sensors? Well, we can actually display that in a very useful way for participants. Uh, for the seizure event, we have a journal. You can see here how we uh, have a sample calendar uh, with several seizures being tracked by day, and we can also see the type of seizure, the duration, and the frequency. You can see how we expand that and tap on the each seizure card. You can see we actually can gather quite a bit of data about its start and its stop time, uh, the duration, how many times people went through the uh, responsiveness test on the watch before they got the answers right. The, and that responsiveness test looks somewhat like this. You can see uh, after a seizure is finished, the, the watch vibrates and prompts a participant to uh, answer a few quick questions. The first is a responsiveness test where they just tap on a circle on the watch face. That lets us know that the participant is aware and they're able to accurately uh, use their motor skills to tap on the, the tap target. Then we launch into a quick memory test where we display uh, a series of blocks, uh, colored blocks, and then we display numbers on top of them. We then remove the numbers and ask people to repeat the pattern. And we repeat that until we get the number, until they get it correct, and then we log the amount of time it takes to get there. Once a seizure event is done, we can then use the abilities of, of Research Kit to gather additional important data about that seizure event. So we can ask for triggers through a quick survey. Um, did you happen to have a warning event ahead of time? Did you take your medications? Uh, did you notice any other triggers? Um, you can see the types of triggers we display here, lack of sleep, stress, et cetera. And we can ask that on both the watch and the iPhone interface. So we can make it easy to participate without having to pull your phone out. Um, we can also look at medication adherence uh, combined with medication reminders. We can then monitor how often did you miss medication, and we can start to look for correlating factors between missed medications, for example, and say a spike in, in seizure events or certain seizure types. We also can look forward to the potential of using these devices for emergency care delivery. Now, it's not something that the, the study does currently uh, in terms of active intervention, but we, do, we are testing the ability to deliver a courtesy notification. So once a participant starts to track a seizure event, we can notify a caregiver or loved one that that seizure tracking episode has begun, and we can also notify them when it has ended with the eye looking forward to that being a potentially powerful tool uh, to help uh, people who have epilepsy be more free within their lives. So the study goals, um, what you can see here, we obviously can do the clinical research for today to understand what's happening in the body with the seizure better currently, but we can also increase patient and caregiver engagement by displaying the data back to them in a useful way that they can then use to go and have a dialogue with their own care teams and see if immediate uh, changes to their, their medications are appropriate to get their symptoms under better control. And then the big goal uh, is to see if we can look at the different seizure types and uh, coming from the sensors 
And if we can utilize algorithms to someday predict the onset of a seizure and then notify a, a participant that a seizure may be about to occur so they can seek a, a more safe position for their physical body, notify a care team, or if they're unresponsive, no, notify uh, authorities for assistance and alert, uh, alert them for care. Now the design process, that you can see it's a, a pretty uh, uh, complex uh, study. And so how do we go about doing that? Well, it starts just by understanding the research kit flow. Uh, and here you can see an example of the flows we worked through with the research team, just showing each screen and module and all the things that it can do on that, on that page or section. That allowed us to then identify what is native in research kit framework, uh, what we could use off the shelf, if you will, versus what we needed to create brand new. And the things that we needed to create brand new, we could then dive into the flow and the sequence, exactly how would it happen. This is an example, an example of seizure tracking uh, for the watch and the watch interface, which was entirely brand new for this uh, study. You can see how we designed each of the features, the flow, the conditional statements. That allowed us to then go into UI design for the watch. You can see here examples of how that occurred. All of these uh, tools, these documents, allowed us to work really closely with IRB to get early feedback from them in the process uh, so that we can, we can track on a, a faster timeline to get to market uh, and be in compliance with what IRB's concerns might be. In parallel to this, we were also working uh, with Acuma Health, uh, who was in charge of the backend uh, database storage for this particular study. And you can see how we went through a process of identifying uh, the architecture of the, of the data and how it would live within the database and how we could separate the concerns of the identifiable data from the study data and how that interacted with the, the watch and the researcher's interface portal. So with that, I'd actually like to turn it back now to Chaz to speak a little bit about IRB concerns, regulatory and security. Great, thanks AJ. Um, so as you can see, Research Care is an incredibly powerful framework um, for engaging uh, you know, subjects and participants, um, uh, manipulating uh, and analyzing data, presenting it back. It's incredibly powerful. Um, but with, as in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. So I want to talk about a couple of the um, sort of the, the catches here what with using Research Kit and in general any kind of mobile um, application framework to, uh, to, to store sensitive data. AJ, where did the, I think we lost the slides here. I'm trying to get it back, I apologize. It looks like somebody else signed in as me and took control. Uh, oh well. The, um, so I'll, I'll talk first about uh, your apps may be regulated. So the actual app that you're using may be re regulated. And I'll talk a bit about that as it pertains to the FTC. Um, I'll talk about how the, your data uh, may be regulated as well. And um, how you may have to protect data, and then I'll talk a little bit about the IRB. Let's see. Can we get the slides back? I'm working on it. Okay. Apologies. One sec. I'm going to stop sharing your screen. Okay, well, when we get the slides back, I'll talk. So the, the, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the, um, the fact that your app may be regulated. So uh, one of the uh, federal organizations that regulates um, healthcare data and healthcare apps is the FDA. And the FDA uh, traditionally regulates medical devices. So any device that's used to diagnose, or treat uh, a medical condition. And uh, in the past few years, the FDA has taken an increased interest in uh, regulating uh, mobile medical applications. Uh, so these are uh, mobile medical applications uh, are, are applications that act as medical devices. So an example would be if you make uh, like an EKG reader for an iPhone or you make a uh, uh, stethoscope attachment for the iPhone camera and you turn your iPhone into a stethoscope. Um, these may be examples. So there are two, two general strategies here uh, with regards to um, with regards to the uh, FTC. AJ, I need control over the screen. That's the last thing here. I'm trying to remember. Let me see. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about medical devices. There are two general strategies here. 
And but the, so the first strategy is to avoid having your app, your research kit app, or, or any uh, app you use research kit in, avoid classification as a mobile medical application. So don't diagnose, don't try to cure, don't try to mitigate, treat, or prevent disease. Um, a lot of times what this means is that you're, you're leveraging user-initiated activities, meaning um, like reporting seizures, for example, or tracking asthma. Even then, though, that may be... Uh, that may not be enough to avoid classification as a mobile medical application. Um, in in a lot of cases, though, that's probably uh, okay. So even if you can't use strategy number one here, which is to avoid classification entirely, you can use a second strategy, which is to qualify for what's called what the FDA calls enforcement discretion, meaning that they will withhold. Uh, they will use their discretion to withhold enforcement uh, and, and otherwise require you to go through the FDA's approval process for medical devices. And they do this for low-risk devices. So they do this for devices that they consider uh, to be uh, posing a lower risk to the public, meaning that they don't try to intervene, they don't try to diagnose or treat, they don't replace an existing medical device, and they don't control an existing medical device. Um, I will note that there's quite a bit of information here. We will make these slides available and a recording available of this webinar later so that you can go back and dig into this a little bit more. As we go into this regulatory and security stuff, there are going to be a bunch of resources here that we link out to that you'll be able to go peruse on your own time. So, um, for example, uh, you know, an app that helps asthmatics track inhaler usage, um, the seizures application, uh, that, that AJ was talking about likely falls into the enforcement discretion category. Um, so these are these are some considerations around the FDA. Um, we also want to talk about HIPAA. So uh, HIPAA is a federal law that protects the privacy and security of healthcare data. It covers what's called protected health information, which uh, is a convoluted uh, definition but what it really relates to is eventually that data has to touch an insurance transaction somewhere in its lifestyle, which uh, life cycle, which means often the academic studies may not be uh, regulated. On the other hand, if you're if you're undergoing a commercial study, if you're from a pharmaceutical company or you want to use research kit for uh, a payer or a provider, if you're from a hospital system or an insurance company, you probably will be regulated by HIPAA. Um, and you might need to uh, take this into consideration. Um, the the upshot of HIPAA is that you have to protect the privacy of the data that you're securing. You have to uh, account for its security, and you have to be ready to respond to breaches and put breach notification measures in place. Uh, you have to make sure that all of the vendors that you would use, such as Thread or Aptable, or uh, you might use IBM Watson to host this, or a range of other um, uh, hosting solutions. You want to make sure that those vendors are approved. Let's see if I can go back here. I cannot go back. Um, you want to make sure that those vendors approve and have special contracts in place. And then the last part I'll, I'll say is that the FTC has catch-all jurisdiction, um, including for some health and some personal information. So the FTC actually made a great little uh, guidance uh, calculator or guidance uh, walk through here and you can you can go to the shortened link here or you can just search FTC mobile healthcare apps guidance um, and it will walk you through which laws might apply to a mobile health app and it will um, cover the uh, HHS's jurisdiction under HIPAA the FDA's jurisdiction uh, the FTC's trade general FTC Act jurisdiction and then the FTC's health breach notification rule, all of which are different regulatory considerations. So with that said, um, I want to talk a little bit about general um, security uh, obligations as well. Um, things to think about as you as you get ready to tee up um, an IRB proposal or you get ready to proceed um, getting your internal legal or security teams to clear your proposal for research kit. Um, he, I've listed out some of the specific security controls that HIPAA declares, but these are things you'll need to think about. How do users log in? How do you store passwords? How do you store credentials? If you're going to use research kit to store 
uh, for example, to conduct a study like an HIV study. The, the mere fact that someone is registered for your study may be sensitive information and you'll need to uh, implement controls over the authentication. Um, access controls, like who can log in? How can they log in? Do you, the researchers have a separate dashboard to the back end? Do you have um, other roles besides just participants? How are you auditing information uh, access on the on the back end, so on the server side where the research kit application is on a phone, that phone needs to connect to a secure data store to store data for the study. Um, when that information is accessed or when that back end API is used, you need to have audit controls in place um, so that you can inspect and verify activity. Um, how are you backing up data? Is ba are the backups automatic? Are they triggered? Are they nightly? Are they weekly? Are the backups encrypted? Is your data encrypted at rest? Is it encrypted in transit? How do you know what controls are in place? So these are all security considerations, um, many of which, uh, again, like an IRB would ask about. Um, and finally, you know, security is only as good as the humans implementing it. And so some of the most important considerations are around manage it. Um, who's going to come up with the list of required controls? Who's going to document them? How are you going to assess that they're actually in place and effective? Who's going to approve them? Who will maintain them? These are all questions. Um, quite often, in an academic context, the IRB will be the gatekeeper, um, and maybe the only gatekeeper here. In private contexts, um, you, you may have a legal department, a security review team, um, some, other, some other organizations to go through. Um, the best thing you can do if you, if you are using this for an academic study and you are um, going through an IRB at your institution, the best thing you can do is uh, to, to <laughs> say, um, get, you know, get by in early and often from the IRB. Um, you want to familiarize them with your consent process. You want to familiarize them for um, the security controls that you're going to apply. You want to, um, this may be something that, you know, at your institution, they may not have seen a research kit application before. They may not be familiar with the concept of storing data uh, in the cloud. And uh, you, you really want to walk them through it and hold their hands through it. So supporting documentation is fantastic. Um, a full overview of the app. Uh, you want to be upfront about identifying potential risks. Um, you want to fully describe what the consent process looks like. If you can use the screens, um, even better to actually show them. And you want to fully develop data security plan um, just ready to go for the IRB. So we, you'd like to be as proactive through the IRB process here, especially when you're dealing with a risk that this may be a new concept for them. Um, you want to sort of overload them with information and show you thought of all this uh, beforehand. Um, I'll also mention just as a bonus consideration here, um, there are there, there may be IP considerations here. So for example, to get your app in the Apple Store, you need a logo. There's going to be um, potentially, if you're doing research that goes beyond just collecting information, you may have algorithmic um, IP that uh, you need to clear with the university. Do you want to eventually spin this off into a company? Or are you just going to use this and publish it? Um, you may want to think about those things. Often IRBs won't have an issue with it, but you will need to go through your university um, as well. Um, so patent, patent com uh, copyright and trademark protection. Um, this will be something that if you're at an academic institution, you often have um, a commercialization office that'll help you work through some of these issues. If you're in a private institution, you should have a legal arm or an IP uh, group that you can go to. Um, getting patent protection is sometimes difficult. Copyright and trademark protection um, are, are much easier, but this is something that your lawyers can help you with. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to AJ to talk about um, user experience and uh, user interfaces. Great. Thanks, Chaz. So one of the great things about uh, the process that we walked you through, the example documents that I showed at the beginning that went through the design process as well as from a technical standpoint as well as from a UI standpoint, is that those all can be used to help your IRB gain understanding. And partners like Optable and Thread Research are here to actually assist you in that process so that you're not walking that journey alone, but rather we're using our collective experience on doing studies like these with organizations like yours to help you uh, and, and anticipate the kinds of needs that they might have. 
But there are also needs that are uh, you need to anticipate, which are your participants and how they have needs of, of a mobile-based research study. And if you think about yourself and how you use your mobile phone, you bring a whole wealth of expectations to every interaction you have on that small screen. When you think about it from the, uh, you doing your mobile banking to doing shopping to doing just quick Google searches and the expectation that you're going to get immediate answers relevant to you back in a timely manner. And so when you drop a clinical research study into the middle of that pool of expectations, that means we actually have to think about adapting the content and the experience to match those expectations in order to maintain a high level of engagement. So we have to think about adapting to the small screen. And when that happens, brevity certainly rules. We definitely wanna look at copy density, right? Nobody likes to read an incredible amount on small screens, but they do watch a tremendous amount of video. Uh, there's a, a wealth of research and statistics showing that video consumption is one of the highest forms of content being utilized in small screens. And we can take advantage of that by utilizing video in the context of research study to help convey information uh, quickly. We also want to look at the text input. Nobody really likes to type a whole lot on a screen. Uh, and thankfully, there are uh, out-of-the-box framework questions uh, structures that allow you to use slider bars and taps and check boxes and quick input mechanisms uh, that reduce the friction created by typing a lot so that your participants can provide you the information you need without requiring them to do a whole lot of work. And diction is really, really important. At the end of the day, we all work in healthcare and we all understand each other nicely, but our participants often don't. And so we have to employ health literacy uh, and really recognize that we're not speaking to each other, but we're rather we're speaking to them. And so a big function that we at Thread Research oftentimes do to help our research partners is we'll take the content that they produce and then we go through an editorial exercise to help make it uh, uh, accessible to uh, the, the correct level of health literacy uh, and then work with them uh, going through IRB to make sure that those edits and changes are, are perfectly acceptable and fine. It's also important in uh, not just being brief, but also being fresh. So you wanna think about constantly updating content in any way you can to keep, keep people coming back. Again, remember we're living in a world where we're competing with Facebooks and Twitters and Instagrams where it's just this constant stream of content. The dashboard, as you can see here, an example from Pride Study, is, an, is a tremendously useful tool uh, to help keep the content fresh. We actually utilize cohort comparisons in this study where we're using a combination of the demographic profile information uh, provided in, in an earlier survey uh, and we compare that the participant to people like them uh, to help show how they relate to other people in the study. It also helps to net the sense of I'm a part of something bigger, uh, even though they're, they're sort of alone on their phone doing this work. Um, asthma, the asthma study has done a really great job of incorporating educational content. So you can see here on the Learn tab, this content is, is useful in keeping people coming back. Uh, we can look also at the asthma app, uh, a doctor's dashboard that's been created, where the same d research data that's collected and displayed back in the participant dashboard, like we see in Pride study, can be used uh, using a gold standard uh, scoring where it exists to produce sort of a, a red-green asthma-controlled response. And this can be spit out uh, very easily for participants to then display to their, their healthcare professionals and help get real-time uh, guidance on their care using the data they're providing you in research, which is also a, an important benefit uh, where we can provide that real-time insight uh, so that we can facilitate a better dialogue between the participant and their care team. Uh, they're more incentivized to stay involved because they're getting real-time meaning uh, and, and help out of a research study that's also helping you. And the final example here uh, that I wanted to show on this screen is from the My Heart Counts study. You can see that this is a, a news feed that's actually published by a, a combination effort of the NIH, the CDC, and the FDA. And you can utilize this API stream of, of content and you can specify the therapeutic category area that you're interested in. And we can pull that content in dynamically into the app to refresh it so that you don't have to do an app push through the app store to get that content updated, but rather we can provide real-time interesting information related to this space using a credible source uh, without you having to do anything beyond the initial publication of the app.
Now, when we go digital, we also have to think a little bit differently in terms not just of the content in the app, but also how we get people to join and, and, and reach them. This is a device in their pocket and they're going about living their daily life. And so we can actually use a lot of the lessons from digital marketing to help reach people and help them understand uh, that this is an important study rele relevant to them and to get them willing to, to enroll uh, or convert, if you will, into the study. Here's an example of Pride study of what some of the things that we did to help reach that audience using some of the lessons we know uh, from digital marketing. We created uh, some branding, so there's a brand mark for the study, uh, and we translated that into the app icon following the, the, the template set up by Apple. Apple. Uh, and then we use that brand mark and that identity to create a, a, a web page where we could drive traffic to, whether that's from a piece of print material, a flyer in a health uh, uh, regional office or a doctor's office, or through uh, media and marketing using online uh, search banner ads, for example, and texting campaigns to get people engaged and enrolled. We also activated content uh, purposefully designed for social media sharing. Uh, again, these are people living on their phones, so let's get them using their phones in the way they normally do to promote the study. And so here you can see an example of the PR kit that has uh, icons uh, for sharing on social media that I'm involved, pre-approved content that's ready to be shared and activated, as well as print material that can be uh, printed and, and, and locally and hung uh, wherever is appropriate. Now, we think it's important to end uh, with a little bit of an acknowledgement towards uh, changing the mindset, not just around how you create content and how you recruit, but also what kinds of costs you would compare. In traditional research, uh, you know your circumstances best, but these are the off often the things that we, we hear our, our cost centers, you know, the medical personnel, the office staff, the clinic space, the office space, uh, survey printing and postage and data processing, and then of course the effort behind participant recruitment. Um, all of that ultimately adds up to a cost per patient. And so that's ideally what you want to try to compare. So just as a way to frame up the different comparing measures you might look at in mobile clinical research, we would look at the app development. You could be an independent app with a standalone research kit app that will be at a certain price point. There is also a model that Thread Research uh, has created for academic institutions called UCOR. And what that does is it shifts the burden of the majority of the app development and the backend architecture working with a company like Aptable to set up the backend infrastructure, uh, the common core modules like consent and learn, uh, as well as the APIs related to them, doing all of that work up front and, and being employed by the academic institution to do that, which then lowers the amount of time and the price that it takes to to spin up individual studies on top of that platform. Uh, so it's much faster, much less expensive for the individual researcher. And again, that's called UCOR. And we can certainly provide more information if that's helpful. Um, you wanna look at digital recruitment. How does that compare to regional recruitment? Um, this, your, your ability to securely host data, the prices associated with that, and your analytics software to, to gain uh, insight out of the data. And again, all of that can add up to a cost per patient that could be used to compare. In general, what we're finding is on the whole, doing mobile clinical research for large scale studies, uh, medium to large scale studies are off, is often cheaper. Uh, you can reach a broader audience uh, with, with less uh, cost associated. So we hope that in addition to just recognizing the potential cost savings, that through this presentation, you also may have recognized that you can get access to new types of data, that data can be continuous, so you don't have to deal with snapshots anymore, but rather the stream of, of rich data coming throughout uh, the, the, the day or the week. And that because of that, what we're seeing across all of these studies is the ability to generate rapid, high-speed insights. These often come in the studies we've done in a matter of weeks and not, not years. And that lets you really work towards more of a responsive research model if you choose. So again, you can see this is something that has picking up great steam and is benefiting many organizations. And we're hoping that today helped to kickstart the thought process for you. And so we would love now to answer any of the questions that you may have entered. Chaz? Great, so I think that um, the way to do this is probably to type questions in the chat if you have questions, um, in the chat or in the, in the Q&A utility down here. So if you have questions about uh, what other types of projects we've worked on, um, the hardest part about getting through an IRB review, um, some of the existing research kit applications out there, 
uh, questions about how you would begin to uh, conceptualize a study. Um, those are all sort of great questions to go for. And if anybody, we'll have to see. I'm hoping that everybody has access to this. Okay. While we wait, AJ, is there anything else uh, you want to talk about or anything we haven't covered? Yeah, I think one of the biggest questions we often get is how long does it take to do this kind of effort? Um, and one of the benefits of working with an open source framework is that as each study is able to complete their work and then share their code, it, it expedites the process for, the, for future studies that come after them. So it really is a community effort, and it's one of the great things about how Apple has structured ResearchKit. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, in our experience, we have, uh, we've, we've experienced a range of time. Uh, very small, simple studies can be spun up very quickly. Uh, it, it's, the limitation isn't usually on the development side, but rather uh, the bottlenecks tend to occur in working with the organization to seek something like IRB approval, um, or working with the technology centers uh, or, or privacy offices uh, to secure all of the right permissions to move forward. So we've we've been able to spin up studies in as little as you know six weeks uh, to eight weeks, uh, and we've we've also taken a lot longer to do them based on the complexity of the study and the circumstances of the organization. What we'll find is that the 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 limitation isn't necessarily on our end, but rather more for um, within the organization itself and we're partners in that process to help you get what you need the information the examples the tools to help have those conversations awesome okay so one question here from jeff was uh do we have other examples of projects so uh, aj you talked about the epiwatch study um, i know that one one that we've done together with thread is the ucsf pride study which is a uh, longitudinal study uh, this is this, this will be something like the framington heart study for lgbtq populations the study may go for decades um, there's a, a link to a, a web page in the chat there. You can go to um, aptable.com uh, backslash customers and find uh, a case study there with Thread and UCSF and a little walkthrough. Um, but that's that's a, a pretty good example of a, a typical uh, academic study. Um, pretty ambitious, uh, designed to scale. So initially we were just concerned about uh, registration and recruitment and um, over time this is going to uh, evolve into a much you know broader study than just a few survey questions and it's gonna it's gonna span for a very long time so that's an exciting example um, AJ is there anything else uh, another example you want to talk about sure I'll, I'll add to that example slightly in that the the goal of the pride study also is to become multi-channel so they're actively working on building out the web uh, interfaces to broaden reach beyond iphone so that they can include a, a much uh, larger portion of the lgbtq audience particularly those who are underserved uh, and and may not have the means to own an iphone mm -hmm. so i think the important thing to note is that Research kit on iPhone is a tremendously powerful way to expedite the process of getting started with research and to create great access very quickly. But it doesn't have to end there. You can you can broaden into a multi-channel approach, and we believe that's very important. Got it. Great. Another uh, study that might be worth mentioning also that uses novel use of, of the, the ability of the iPhone uh, is Mole Mapper study. Uh, so Mole Mapper, uh, with uh, Dr. Dan Webster, uh, was started by him as a as a project on his own, and then he joined forces forces with OHSU to study melanoma. And it has a really great interface that allows you to do a photo journal of moles on your body at risk and compare them to common uh, coins like pennies and dimes, and then to monitor over time. Uh, and then again, uh, we're looking to see not only can we surface data to help you manage your risk factor in real time and have real conversations with real data with your doctors uh, in real time care, but also to look forward to the future of can we then use that data to develop algorithms that can help predict risk of melanoma just using the camera. Great. Yeah, and we've dropped a link to the chat. If you just Google mole uh, mapper. Uh, yeah, you'll you'll have uh, some links on Google there. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go start answering some of the Q and A questions here. Okay. Um, uh, Radar Campbell asks: Are there concerns or conversations around open sourcing existing full implementations, or 
would the end of life of projects not lend to that? So we can talk a little bit about uh, open source. And um, so open source is primarily an IP, an intellectual property consideration. When you open source something, you allow others to use it and possibly reuse it depending on certain conditions um, for their own purposes. Sometimes you're required to give attribution, sometimes you're not, etc. So when we say research kit is an open source uh, framework, what it means is it's, it's a bunch of pre-written iPhone, iOS code that Apple allows you to take freely and reuse, put it in your own applications. And it has a bunch of handy built-in functions. Now you can extend that, you can change those functions, you can uh, add more, you can make your own, you know, ultimately your own iPhone app. Um, the question around uh, whether you would open source the full developed application. So for example, if you, if you worked with Thread to uh, customize research kit, extend it and turn it into your own study, the question around whether you could open source it really revolves around whether you own it. And that's something that you usually have to talk to your, um, your IP, your lawyers, your IP office, your university about. Um, in many cases, especially in academics, that's probably going to be okay. Um, if you do want to retain any commercial interest, you want to make sure that you open source it with the appropriate open source model. Um, I hope that that answers that question. I think also, too, it's important to recognize that the hope by the community uh, using ResearchKit is that you will contribute either parts or all of your study back so that we can expedite research globally so that everyone gets the benefit of everyone else's work. Yeah, um, and you can do that in a way that, for example, if you have a trademark or you have a, a brand um, that you want to keep the rights over so that that's not diluted, you can open source that in a way that allows other people to use the, um, the code but still protects your right to um, control that brand or control it. Correct. And also using the code doesn't obligate you necessarily to commit your code back. It's the hope that you will, but we do have examples where there is a proprietary element, say an algorithm that might has the potential for commercialization, but we might share other parts of the code, but that may not be shared. Right. And also remember that these research studies in many cases in a commercialization path are being used to validate just a core function or component that will then be turned into a separate application that you develop that is proprietary to you. And once that happens at the end of life of the research study, you're moving forward with the code that you want the, for IP into a different app. So there is a, a clean break between the two, which reduces Absolutely. any concerns. So I'm going to answer um, I have, I have three questions that are actually all uh, along the same line. So good, good thinking here. Um, so Roderick asks, are you seeing more interest in research groups now that research kit's been out for a year or so? And Bob uh, Spiran asks, the medical field is slow to adopt new digital technologies. How receptive are you finding the industry to these new types of technologies and how high is the interest level? Um, and the, the answer is the interest level is extremely high. The um, sort of the ability of research groups to execute on something like this is extremely low. Uh, research groups and academic groups are generally not full of iOS developers, um, and they're not sort of capable of putting together uh, an application usually um, on their own, much less you know in a reasonable amount of time, much less making it really you know sexy and branded and having all the bells and whistles and shiny. Um, that said you know, almost everyone would love to be able to use the framework and use, you know, uh, mobile phones to recruit and uh, and to, to have participants go through a study. I mean, it makes, it makes your subject pool the world. Anyone with a phone in the world uh, becomes a potential participant. So it's extremely high, but it's still, I'd say it's still fairly um, Nascent. And then a related question here, Michael uh, Shembri asks, what kind of resistance have you gotten from IRBs over the use of cloud-based storage? And have you be able, been able to successfully work with them to address their concerns? Which goes back to um, the issue of this being fairly new and fairly novel. This hasn't been done before. This is, this is very much uh, cutting edge. Um, if you are developing a research kit application for a particular study, there's a pretty good chance um, that you are the first person ever in the history of the world to, to do that for that particular kind of study. Um, that said, uh, you know, there, there's a bunch of different ways to, um, 
to work with the storage and the privacy and security component of it. Almost all of them, though, are you're going to want to use cloud storage. And IRBs are, are surprisingly, um, once you explain everything to them, you very clearly and carefully lay out where is the data going to be stored, who is the custodians, what are the physical, technical, and administrative safeguards applied to protect that data. How uh, is user access facilitated? How is it locked down? How is it controlled? You, that's all fairly um, standardized. So for example, if you are familiar with working with HIPAA, um, if, you, if you go through a HIPAA security protocol with the IRB, um, all, basically all their concerns will be addressed. And the cloud is mature enough um, to the point where using a cloud-based storage solution allows us to unify the security controls. So it allows, it allows us to put all of the security controls in one place where you can manage them with code, meaning that um, this, the, the likelihood or the chance of um, different local configurations or local storage uh, devices or storage locations getting out of sync in terms of security controls uh, is, is, is non-existent. Um, and the, furthermore, the cloud, uh, whether it's Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, whoever is the underlying data center provider, and the vendors have uh, matured tremendously in the last, uh, definitely the last 10 years. So a Amazon Web Services launched in 2006, and for many years it was, you can't use the cloud, it's dangerous, it's unsecure, I can't believe you put our data up on the internet for anyone. Um, and that's no longer the case. Now a lot of very smart people uh, director of the FBI, director of the, uh, uh, what is it, the director of national intelligence, the CIA. The CIA actually has an entire Amazon um, cloud deployment. They have an entire section of the cloud. So there are a lot of very smart people and, and people who are working with very sensitive data who have bought into um, cloud security as the model that is the, you know, sort of the most protective now. And the cloud cloud vendors are all willing to sign data protection agreements, business associate agreements, and security addendums and breach indemnification agreements um, that make them sort of safe and trustable um, to use for sensitive data. So uh, while the resistance from IRBs is, is the level of just doing any kind of diligence, they ask the right questions, um, and they, they sort of um, have their security and privacy uh, mindset right. Um, the answer is it's actually very easy to get IRB approval when you're properly prepared for these. Uh, we've never had, uh, with, with my company, we've never had a customer working with us ever fail to clear an IRB or a security review or a vendor assurance review. Um, so it's fairly, it's fairly standardized. It's, I wouldn't say it's necessarily easy work just yet, although we're trying to make it easier, um, but it is absolutely possible. Any other questions? Okay, AJ, is there anything uh, you'd like to wrap up with? No, I just, the only comment I would give is don't let the fear of something unknown hold you back. There are great companies out there like, like Aptable and Thread Research who are here to help you accomplish your goals. So paint the vision, dream, dream really big, and it's incredibly possible very, very quickly using the technology we have at our fingertips today. And we're excited to, to hear what your ideas are and to see if we can help you accomplish them. And good okay. luck. Fantastic. So we have, um, we'll end with uh, our contact information. So if you'd like to email um, AJ or I to ask any kinds of questions or discuss um, anything, we uh, very frequently give a lot of advice and a lot of free advice. So if you have anything you want to bounce off us or questions, uh, this is focused on Research Kit. If you have questions about Care Kit or questions about uh, web applications or other types of mobile applications to uh, conduct research with, um, just give us a shout. We would love to hear from you. Okay, thanks everyone.